that God says in Genesis 1 to people, that that's kind of what he wanted them to do. But I think he built into this beautiful planet. People are his highest creation, but also animals were to be fruitful and multiply, and then plants as well, because he talks about how they will bear fruit. And so that's emphasizing the idea that they can propagate and you know have next generations and all. So I think it's just this amazing, amazing, profound principle that magnifies God for me when I work with plants and see the miracle of a tiny little seed that can grow into something majestic and beautiful and or um, able to be eaten. It reminds me of God's life-giving power that he's, you know, has created seasons, he's created the plants, he's created all these things that um, really prove life goes on. He is the source of life. He is the source of light and all those things we talked about in our introduction. And herbs fit the bill of being fruitful and multiplying. Um, so Ray, I just hit the red stop share when I want to go back to live. Okay, thank you. Let me do that. Um, I can't find my cursor, hun. Maybe I'll just go on if you can find it for me. Are you all still there, Leona? Yes, you're there? Yes, we are here. Thank you. We're looking, you're looking good. Okay. You're looking handsome, Ray? Yeah, we do what we can. <laughs> Hold on, we can't find the cursor. It, there we go. There we are, something's, there we are. Stop share. Now go up to it. Oh, there's no cursor. Yes, it is right there. Oh, I guess. Okay. Yes, I have to work out these technicalities, and hopefully then yeah. I will figure it out. Okay. So escape, and then cursor. Okay. So let me give you an overview of what I plan to cover today. Hopefully in an hour, so we may be whizzing through things. But I wanted to show you how to start herbs from seed, how to root herbs in water. And, and we'll go through each of these in detail, so you'll, you'll get the idea, but I'm just giving you the big picture here. Um, also, how to plant the cuttings of herbs. So you might have a neighbor that has an herb that you really like, and you can um, ask them for just a cutting, and then you can propagate your own herb, and it's all free, and that's great. Also, um, some just a, a wide array of garden plan ideas from tiny little windowsill garden or one pot all the way up to, you know, a, a big garden in your yard if you have one. Um, I'm, I'm going to talk a bit about saving seeds and the winter care of herb plants um, and then a brief dive into the pest management and soil amendments. Although herbs are really beautiful plants and they don't have as many pests as other plants, like a lot of vegetables and things like that. They really are pretty hardy fellows. Okay, so let's try and go back into my share screen. And let me show you my first. How do I play? Okay, here's my version, one version of many, to be happy is to buy plants and not even buy them. Even happier is to get a free plant or to just buy a simple packet of seeds. But you will find if you, if you try this a little more that you will too maybe find that plants are amazing. So let me be a testimony to say you can do this. Don't think you don't have a green thumb. I don't either. It's just God works in the, in the middle between you and the plant. Um, and it's not an exact science. If you fail at one point, just try again. Don't say I'm bad at it. Get, don't give up. Also be flexible and think creatively. I love that part of herb growing because, you know, it's not like, oh no, if I do this, it's wrong. Well, try it. Maybe you'll find a new way to, you know, plant your plant in a container that you never thought of as a pot before or that kind of thing. Learn from your failures. That's really good. That's the principle of persevering and not giving up. Don't say I can't do it. Just say, hey, I didn't do that right. Or maybe the weather didn't 
help me this year and I'll try again next year or whatever. So practice, practice, practice. And also I love the idea that there's a poem that says hope springs eternal in the human breast, I think it says. Um, but I love the idea because every spring, not only does it spring eternal in the, the earth, but also every spring you have a new opportunity to start over. And that's really a great part of growing plants. So here's some basic facts about herbs. They're, like I said earlier, they're easy to grow. They aren't, they aren't real demanding. You don't have to nurture them like maybe a rose bush or something. They do like full sun. So that's something you got to consider when you, especially in the winter time, you need to put them, if you're having them indoors, in your sunniest spot in your house, if, you're, if they're going to survive. Uh, they usually don't need too much fertilizer. And they love to be picked. So that's unusual because I used to be a gardener where it's like, oh, you know, don't pick that flower because it might be the only one, but not with herbs. The more you cut their hair, the more it grows, just like human hair. Um, like I said earlier, many of the popular herbs like uh, oregano and rosemary and some of those that are used a lot in cooking originated in the Middle East. And so they don't need as much water. Other ones like parsley and few others do like pop water a little more, but um, typically if you put it in the ground, it's gonna be okay. And you can tell if it wilts a little that it might need a drink if you have rain, seasonal rain. Um, so herbs are great, like we talked about in our first presentation, they taste good, they can heal you, and the, I love the part too that they have flowers. So they, what can go wrong if you have an herb or a plant that can do all of those things for you? They, it's practical, healthy, fun, and cheap to grow your own. And then you have, you know, even an aloe plant, if you keep one in your house and you burn yourself when you're cooking, you can just pull off a leaf and heal yourself and, and really stop the pain quickly. And like I said, uh, you can also share with your neighbors if you start some herbs, or you can ask your neighbor for some of their cuttings or seeds and you can grow your own. So there's really a lot of advantages to growing herbs. And I list here just some of the most popular herbs that people grow. Most people start out with culinary herbs because they like to eat their herbs and then you can kind of branch from there. But um, on the one column there, you'll see I have the annual herbs basil, rosemary, lemon verbena, oregano, marjoram, savory, and parsley. And then on the other side are perennial herbs. And uh, some of them have stars because like rosemary, even though it's an annual in most areas, in my area, because our winters are so cold, I do have to bring it in in the winter um, if it's gonna, and it will sometimes survive. In places that are um, warm, like uh, in Florida in the United States, rosemary probably can be grown as a perennial. Um, then other ones on the perennial side, like dill, that first one, um, it self-seeds a lot. And so even though it's kind of an annual herb, it will drop its seed and the next year where it has dropped seed, you will have it again. So it's kind of like a perennial. Okay. So you've heard of having a green thumb. That means you're just a really good gardener. And I don't believe anybody is born with a green thumb. None of us have green thumbs. Um, you just have to not give up. That's how you grow a green thumb. But I thought this was kind of funny that the rule of the green thumb, or rather than just the rule of thumb, is that when you plant your seeds, you want to put them at a depth equal to or three times their width. So for me, simple ideas like that help me to remember when I'm planting, you know, not that I have to look up every single detail about every single seed, but think, okay, this is a little teeny tiny seed, so I don't want to plant it real deep. Um, and it's better to plant seeds too shallow than too deep. Okay, let's go back to stop share, and I'm going to show you some uh, jump in here and show you some things about actually planting seeds. And so it's very simple, really. There's only three things you need to start growing your own herbs. Some seeds, there's a packet of seeds, um, a container, and I, you can do anything from the simplest to the most um, complex. So this is just a pot that I, I recycle all the plots that I 
you know, grow up or buy a plant with. And it, I just am going to replant in it. It had a pot in it originally. Here's a ceramic pot. You can use clay pots. You can use, here's little cheapo plastic pots from the dollar store. And here I grow a lot of my seeds just in plant, or pots that I've recycled from other plants. Or you can get a little more complex. And it's not really terribly expensive if you think of it as an investment because I use these kinds of things over and over. So can you see that? Yeah. Um, this is a slotted cell type of planter that is great because underneath you can put the water because a lot of seeds other than at the very beginning it's preferable to water them from the bottom because if you're watering from the top all the time especially if it's an indoor situation the seeds can um, grow bacteria or mold it's you don't have to i don't always obey that but it's better i mean obviously god makes the rain come from above but when the plants are are babies sometimes they can share um, disease that way. And the other nice thing about this type of a planter is it comes with a plastic dome lid, if you can see that, so that it can hold the moisture in as your seeds are germinating. So that's a really nice advantage to it because when the seeds are just germinating, they're just like little babies. You got to take a little bit of extra care of them. Okay, so as I said, you can get your seeds um, from friends. You can buy a packet at the store. Just try your favorite herb that you like or try one you have never heard of that you'd like to learn about and um, get them from friends. You can also save your own seeds. If you grow one plant, you know, it'll last you through the year. And if you save seeds, then you can keep going on for multiple years. Um, let's see. The one thing about your container which I didn't know when I was younger, and I'm glad I've learned the lesson, is it has to have good drainage. So you can't have, if you're going to use a pot that you have around the house, or a cup or anything, you have to poke holes in the bottom. So, you know, if you buy a pot at the store, typically they will have holes in them. Other times they will, I, like, um, I don't have a tin can here, but you have to poke holes to have drainage, because if that plant is sitting there in water and you're watering it faithfully and maybe you're overwatering it all that water is growing up in the roots there and the roots then can become moldy um, you can drill uh, you can use a hammer and a nail to poke your holes um, you can use a drill if it's maybe a ceramic pot but be careful with that because sometimes they'll crack most like clay pots are I don't have any clay pots here are you know built with a hole in them but you have to always check on that then I wanted to show you just to demonstrate planting some herb seeds and I thought it'd be kind of fun um, that you can even use a common household item. Can you see what this is? I'm kind of in the dark here. An eggshell. Hooray! We have chickens on our little farm and so I haven't, I have tried eggshells but I didn't this year and I wish I had, I kind of forgot about them. But you just rinse it out, you take a pin and poke a hole in the bottom because what I just told you about drainage, you have to make sure the water can get out. And <laughs> that's okay. I made a bigger hole, but it's okay. The water can get out. Um, then you fill it with some soil and plant your seeds. Fill it about two thirds with soil. And typically, if you're going to buy a pot, um, we're going to talk in a minute about your potting soil, but if you buy some soil, You'll have it a little moist when you're planting your seed, already pre-moistened. And so then you can use your pinky, poke your finger down in there, put your seed in there, put a little more soil on top, and then put your egg in your egg carton. Oh, you can also, I thought this was handy dandy. I looked at some um, YouTube videos and I thought, oh, perfect. Like, okay, I'm gonna plant basil in this guy. Well, God has provided you the perfect pot. So you have it all ready to go. And then the other beautiful thing about eggshells is when it gets its first true leaves and it's looking like it's got some roots in there, you might even pull up one to make sure some root system is growing. Then you can take your egg and take it to wherever you want to plant it or if you're going to put it in a pot and crack it a little bit gently. And that shell is going to nourish the roots, nourish the plant. The roots will get out and grow into the ground or into the pot. And it's just been its own little self-contained pot for you 
made by God or and through a chicken. <laughs> so I love that idea. Um, okay, what's next? Oh yeah, you you might don't forget the humidity part of germinating and if you can and warmth. So if you can put it in a sunny place and or some people use like an electric little heating mat or maybe you even have a warm place on a radiator or near your oven, I don't know. But um, warm and sunny and watch the amount of water. You'll you'll do great. Okay, let's see. There's another uh, let me show you this first and then I'll talk about that. Show you the slide. Um, so this is my mega big bag because I do pot up a lot of things, but it's cheaper, of course, to buy things in bulk. And I'm gonna give you an example of um, a recipe where you could even buy the uh, ingredients for your potting mix and mix it yourself if you got into it and wanted to go to that trouble. But typically I would suggest since you're starting, just buy a little bag of decent quality potting mix wherever you can um, and use that to get give yourself a start because they already have in them the the drainage elements, the nutri nutrient elements, and the things that will help you to have a good start for especially for seed germination because you can't necessarily just go dig a pile of dirt in your yard and put it in a pot and have your seeds germinate. It could <laughs> but it may or may not depending on the soil in your area. Okay, um, so let me show you that slide, and this will be on the slides so you can um, look at it later if you want to look at this recipe. Uh, well, here I'll show, I don't think I showed you this one. So, seeds and seed, seedings seedlings in good quality soilless potting mix. And then here's, how do I make it big again? Oh yeah, play, sorry. Um, here's some recipes that are really quite famous in the United States. Cornell University um, came up with this and this is still kind of mixed recipes that they use all over our country and you know the elements are the kinds of things that good potting mix would always have. So it's got a one part peat moss. Again, I've got big old bags here, but oh yeah, you can't see. Um, I'll show you in a minute, but peat moss is literally a natural product from peat bogs that um, holds moisture and adds drainage. And then um, sand or perlite. Perlite is a man-made thing. Again, I'll show you, but it, it adds texture to the soil and helps it to drain. Um, coconut core, I have a picture there of that, is just the inner part of a coconut shell. And it's kind of neat because they used to grow coconuts and not know what to do with all the outer part of a coconut shell. And now they mass produce it and it's very useful for gardening. Again, it holds retains the moisture in your pot. And then that second soilless mixture has bone meal, ground limestone, and blood meal. Are They aren't very expensive at all. Those are additives that they would add for nutrients in their soil. Okay, let me show you real quick. You could help me remember how to do this. Or can you do it when I don't want to go back and forth. Okay. Um, so here's the peat moss. Again, it's just a brown substance that you can add water to it before you mix it. It's kind of crunchy now, so I would need to um, soak it in water for a while before I would add it to a mix. And then here's perlite. It's just a even know it might be made out of a mineral. I know vermiculite is another additive and it's actually mined and it's a mineral that's almost like a rock. Oh, it could be something like that, but you'll see, you'll, you'll probably recognize it when you look at a potting mix now. It's just little tiny white globules, you know, and it allows that soil to drain. Sand can be used in the same way. Okay, and then don't forget your water and your sunlight when you're planting your plant. One thing on that note is that you would want to use 
a watering can, not like this guy, the little plastic guy. Um, when you're watering your seeds from the top, you would want to use one. And I love the fact that this thing that's on the end of a watering can is called a rose. If you can see it, you know, the thing that has the little holes in it. It's going to be a much gentler spray when you're watering your seedlings or either seedlings or seeds because you don't want to wash your seed away by watering, you know, overzealously and you don't want to knock the little baby seedling plant down when you're over watering. So try and have a watering can and or you can sometimes mist the plant or I sometimes use sometimes use this thing which is not very expensive and it's a sprayer that some people use like for fertilizers and stuff but you hand pump the pressure in it and so then you can spray your plants it will just spray itself and you don't have to work so hard and um, so you just hand hand pump it um, so people and I sometimes also you can use this if you want to spray on a natural fertilizer at times. So this is a really good investment. It doesn't cost a whole lot though. Okay, let's go on to the actual planting of the seeds. When you're going to plant or say you want to grow some seeds. I know you guys are coming into spring, but maybe you're not to your frost free date yet. I don't know. When is your frost free date? Do you know? Um, we are pretty close to the end of our frost days. I reckon by the end of September, we should not have any more frost. Okay, so um, this, this is perfect timing for you to plant hmm. some seeds indoors. Because um, the typical rule of thumb is a month before your frost free date. So okay. in our part of the world, May 15th is when our frost free date is, you know, frost is passed. Um, but that's when you can start if you want to do your little eggshells or whatever start them inside put them in your window And then by the time you get to frost free You can put them right out into the ground and they'll get if you have spring rain, which we do here They'll get a good start on life and they'll be outside and they'll be very happy little herbs So um, I think I told you about watering gently you keep the soil moist until they germinate all the time you want it to be moist when those seeds are in there so you know unlike a plant which maybe you might water once a week or something the seeds want that water that helps crack the helps the seed to crack open its seed casing and get those roots going and things um, and I mentioned before, but once you've grown your little babies, first they send out a set of leaves that are called cotyledons. I don't know what that means, but it's just a tiny little set of like newborn leaves. Those aren't the true leaves of the plant. It's not until your second set of leaves appear that they're going to look more, you know, like real leaves of whatever particular plant you have. A lot of times the cotyledons all look kind of alike, but then the second set of leaves is going to be um, the plant show you that the plant is coming mature and has some roots going and things. So at that point, you can very carefully transplant it. If you say I have it in a really small container pot like this one, this is kind of small and not got a lot of root, room for roots to grow. So I might pot it up again in something this size, you know, after it's grown its true leaves. So it has some more space to spread out or I can plant it in the ground or whatever. You can kind of play around with what point you have time or energy to put it outside or what you want to do with it. If you want to leave it in a pot, you can take it from its small stage into your big pot as long as you're going to keep it in a protected environment for a while. And speaking of which, you have to always harden off your plants before you put them outside. And what hardening means, it's kind of the process of, gra process of gradually exposing your plants to the outdoor elements and the conditions that they're going to face as a big boy out there. So um, it encourages the plant to be stronger, like its stem will get stronger once it experiences a little bit of wind and it will start to be, um, you know, welcoming the sun in a more powerful way. But you have to do it, um, typically you start them in the shade 
and you put them out some people say like a few hours a day or whatever i'm the kind that i, I i'm not real good about babying my plants that much but i do have a shady less windy spot that i'll put them out there and leave them there for a week or so if it gets really cold at night i will take them back in so you don't want them to be exposed to too much of change in temperature but make sure you know about that hardening off because a lot of like i remember me back in the day i'd have my little plants and i'd put them outside and then i'd be sad because you know they they got too cold and they turned brown or whatever so that's a really important um thing to know about Okay, let's show you, I'm going to give you a demonstration of planting garlic. Let's see, I did want to, sh well, I'll show you. No, I'll go ahead and show you now. Um, share screen. Sorry for all the kind of back and forth, but I, I wasn't going to do PowerPoint and then I thought, well, maybe it will be helpful. How do I do that, Ray? Play, I got it that time. <laughs> Okay. Um, Dana, so, you become very tech savvy and it is helping a lot with the PowerPoint. Thanks for your trouble. Oh, I'm, I hope. <laughs> uh, it's working. I'm very happy and I'm glad your internet and my internet are working. So this is, this is working. Okay. So place your little babies in a warm sunny space. Keep them moist until the seeds germinate. And what we're now going to talk about is garlic. And I loved that. I was trying to find a free picture online for garlic breath and that's kind of a hard thing to Google. <laughs> but I found this horse and doesn't he look like he's just got really bad breath? But my quote to you is garlic breath is so worth it because garlic is a very easy plant to grow if you know how to do it and you do it at the right time. Um, so let me go back to me again. Stop share. There we go. Hey, I'm getting faster. So where is my garlic? Here is a bulb of garlic, it's called. And you have to know the difference between a bulb and a clove. Otherwise, even in cooking, you might have really powerful or really weak food. So a, a, a bulb is the whole shebang here. But inside it, instead of having seeds like a lot of plants, garlic has these little individual units that are all snug in together called cloves. So you can see the clove. Maybe you've cooked with them and you know flavored food with them. It's one of the most popular herbs in the world probably. So many cuisines love garlic. And what's great about garlic is it's so good for you. Like it's a natural antibiotic. You can eat, some people eat a garlic clove a day. It's really strong and it'll burn your mouth, but that's for the tough guys. Um, but you can cook with it, you can, um, take capsules, they make bottle capsules and you pay a lot of money for garlic capsules that will help your immune system. So garlic is amazing. The trick about garlic is you have to plant it in the fall. That's why I'm not so good about it as I should be because usually I'm in the spring mode of planting, but garlic is planted in the fall and it's the clo and you just plant one little clove. So if you buy, even if you buy garlic at your grocery store, you can plant those guys. If you like that particular kind of garlic, you don't have to go order some exotic form of garlic or anything. You can plant your garlic clove that you use in your cooking. It should be viable and grow for you. So you separate the clove and you just poke it in the ground and you leave it over the winter. And then um, in the spring and then late spring, early summer, well, in the spring, it'll send up green shoots that you know are tall, single leaved green shoots. And they, they will absorb the sun and all. And I don't know if you noticed in that picture I had of the garlic, but there was a white multifaceted flower on top. It will flower. And all that has to happen. You want it to go through its whole life cycle. And then the leaves will kind of die back. The flowers will fall off and the leaves will start to turn brown in late spring or summer, early summer, early to mid summer, depending on your garlic. At that time, you can harvest it. And um, it's then you can leave it to cure maybe a week or so, just let it lay outside and dry out completely. A lot of people, which I've tried it and never been too successful. One of these days I'll learn where they'll, they'll braid their garlic bulbs together. They'll take those brown leaves and braid them. And then you can hang it in your kitchen. And whenever you need some garlic, you've grown it yourself. And it's a great resource and a really fun herb to grow and a very commonly used one. 
Okay, let's move on then to rooting plants in water. Ray, can you kind of pull it back a little so they can see my... Ugh. I have a fancy tray, but it's only fancy because I got it at a garage sale the other day. <laughs> and I encourage you, you have new eyes when you become a gardener or if you already are one. You go to garage sales and you your treasure is somebody else's junk. You know, people often are getting rid of their own old, if you have garage sales in your area, but they get rid of their old pots that are around the house that they don't ever use or whatever. And um, so think of it with gardening eyes and you may find lots of treasures that you never noticed before. But I had already been trying to root all my jars and these are just canning jars I use. And I do, because we live on a farm, I do can some of our food. And so I always have these jars around, but you could have a jar from food that you have in the basement or, you know, that you've used, or you could use I, I saw a video of a guy used a water bottle and he just put his rootings in to a purchased plastic water bottle. I wouldn't necessarily recommend that. I kind of like the idea of glass and clear because then you can kind of watch the roots as they're starting to develop and all. But what you do when you want to root plants in water is you make sure, um, actually I kind of need that picture, but I'll show you first. You make sure that you have um, at least three nodes they're called. And I'm gonna show you a picture of a plant in a minute that will show you, but a node part of the plant is where the leaves come out. That's all you have to know is it's, the, it's got a little notch on the plant. I don't know if you can see it here, but there's little notches here, here, and here as to where there were leaves. But I've pulled the leaves off and made sure the nodes are there because that's where roots will form if you either stick it in the ground for some plants, but it's a lot easier to start it in soil yourself and take care of it um, or in water. So I've got three nodes. I've pulled off the other leaves and I've just stuck it in a jar of water. It's as simple as that. Not all plants will um, root and I haven't done a whole lot of this. So I've been experimenting the last, oh, sorry the last few weeks with some of these, but some of them, um, one of my mint plants, which guy is it? This guy, he has a baby root coming out on him. So I'm so excited because I've just taken a cutting off an existing plant and I have a baby roots developing. And so when the roots get about two to three inches, I can then stick it in some soil and I will have started a new plant. Now, some plants like uh, rosemary, if you're going to do it this way and or if you're going to take a cutting and put it in soil, they're going to take a year or two to develop into a mature plant. But other ones like mint, they'll take off really quickly. And you'll learn as you work with um, your herbs that some are just really quick about re producing themselves or spreading. Mint, as I've talked about before, spreads by its roots and sends out runners and it's a very invasive plant. So it's just wants to grow and that's something to know about the mint family. But that's a really good thing if you harness it and use it properly. Um, so with my, my roots here, I change the water when I remember um, but if the water gets murky or anything, you need to change it because the whole point of changing out the water is you don't want bad bacteria or anything to be growing in there and kill your, your cutting. Um, and it usually takes two, three, four weeks maybe for some good roots to form and then you can start your plant and transplant it into soil. So let me, any questions about that? Or I guess I haven't really asked any questions about anything we've talked about. Can you put that down and I will um, show them my slide real quick. Um, Dana, would you put a feeding, like a fertilizer or something in the water if you are rooting them as well or a rooting product or do you just leave it with normal water? And what about right. like chlorine in water? Do you use boiled water or do you can just use normal tap water or shall we try for pure? Good, good question. Um, as far as adding fertilizer or anything, no, I wouldn't. It, it works with water because you might, it might say have too much nitrogen and that can kill the plant or it might, it just, it's easier and I would say safer to just use water. I'm just using tap water um, and experimenting. I haven't heard or read people say, oh, chlorine's going to make it not work or anything. I think that the 
plants are hardy and they will kind of make themselves grow. Maybe there are better ways to do it. You could try, I guess, distilled water. In my mind, and this is just me, I kind of feel like even in tap water, there are some nutrients and things probably that the plant can take up, whereas distilled water is kind of pure dead water in some ways. I don't know. That's just how I kind of have thought about it. But this is a new thing that I'm experimenting with too. So um, that's those are good questions. Okay. Um, well, we'll try. We'll come back to you about that. Right. You you give me your feedback. You guys give it a try and see what happens. But it's kind of cool because one plant can provide you with lots of plants if you if you experiment around with this. Um, so on the screen, you see a picture of a plant. And if you see the, the bottom green leaves there of our little fellow, he, those are his cotyledons. So those are his baby leaves that are, they stay on the plant for a while after it grows. In fact, I have a basil plant right here and I can see the cotyledons still on it, on the bottom of it. And this is about a four, leaf, four inch tall plant. But you always want to harvest your herbs above a node. And does anybody remember what a node is, right? That's the little notches. And you can see in the illustration, those little notches where the leaves are coming out. So those are places on the plant that have extra hormones and energy that are going to send your roots out. So that's always where you want to um, harvest them or cut them. And like I said before, you wanted three um, nodes on a, a uh, cutting that you're going to put in water. So let's look too at um, putting cuttings directly, stem cuttings directly in the soil. Okay, that's why that picture. So I just put an illustration here that this could be somebody who instead of putting them in water has taken their stem cuttings and put them directly in the soil. And some there's debate back and forth. Some people say water works fine. Some people say it's a lot better to start them because you don't disturb the roots if you start it in the soil directly. Um, the benefits of either way is that you're going to have an earlier harvest than you would from seeds. That you're going to have a clone of your mother plant, so it will have the same characteristics of disease resistance, flavor, um, that kind of thing of your mother plant. So that's something to consider too as you're deciding which plant particular specimen you're going to cut a cutting from. You know, pick your healthiest, happiest herb plant and then go from there. Um, and I think that's I need to show you then. I'm going to show you a taking a cutting escape. Thank you. And then share screen. Stop share. Okay. So I'm going to show you how to pick the part of the plant that you're going to take a cutting from. And again, this cutting could be for you're rooting in water, which sometimes you can pick a larger cutting for that. Or maybe it's going to be for sticking in soil. So here's a rosemary plant. This is a garage sale bucket that I've got it planted in, and it's a pretty happy guy. And I'm looking around on it, and what you want to do is find new growth if you can. The best time if you had a choice to do cuttings would be in the spring because that's when the plants are just shooting out every which direction. They have a lot of energy and um, growth hormone or whatever it is in them that causes them to just blossom and grow quickly. But I can do it here in the fall in my area too. So I'm looking around at my rosemary and here's one. What you'll know is there's parts of the plant that are firmer and stiffer than others. So I've taken a cutting and why I've selected it is as you can see here, perhaps, you can see up to this point right here, the stem is really green, isn't it? And then it's kind of brown. And if I pull on it here, it's super soft on the tip, the growing tip part. This type is kind of bendy. And as I get further down, like it, it's not doing it here, but if I had picked a different one, it would crack because the stem is so woody and firm. So you want to make sure that you're getting um, a soft new tip or the parts where our nodes are closer together and or some of that growing root or stem part, not the harder, older stem. So I'm gonna take my cutting here and I can 
count, here's one, two, three, four, five. So I've got a whole lot of um, nodes on my plant. And again, you can see them where each of these seed pairs come out. I mean, leaf pairs come out, that's a node. And I'm going to leave a little bit of the brown, but mostly going to have the green in my tip. And I'm going to cut it right above a node. Because the nodes are where the roots are going to come. And then I'm going to pull off those leaves on the bottom. In fact, some of them demonstrations, they even cut off the leaves a little bit because that's causing the plant to lose more moisture. And you don't need a whole lot of leaf for this right now. What you're really wanting the plant to concentrate on is developing its roots. So I have, a, you know, a tiny little cutting here by the time I'm done. And I will just stick it in a pot, a little pot, or in one of my grow pots. And you can do, you know, a lot of Like I said earlier, basil is a good one to do cuttings. It will take about a year to grow, which is an annual around here anyway in our part of the world. So it will give you good um, harvest. Rosemary takes about two years and other plants, you can do this with other plants too, not just herbs like hydrangeas are a bush. I don't know, do you have hydrangeas in South Africa? Yes, we do. Yes, okay. So you can do cuttings on hydrangeas and grow yourself a beautiful flower bush too. There's a lot of plants that taking a cutting will work as long as you're patient. And, and especially in the spring, you're gonna get a lot of growth on those cuttings a lot quicker than perhaps mine will since I'm doing it in the fall. Okay, so now I'm gonna move from cuttings and propagation. Are there any questions about that? Actually, what was that? oh, I, another way, I don't guess I talked about it here, but like this is a um, basil plant that I just got. I was so excited because it is fall here, but I decided I wanted to try, which I've never done before, try actually planting a little herb garden in a pot. Can you hand me that container um, for the winter and see, because I've often taken herbs in and I have some success like by dividing the herbs I have outside. But this year I'm going to try and plant my own little herb garden in this pot. And I, I called the greenhouse, nobody had herbs. Guess where somebody suggested to me and that where I got my herbs for $1.99 each at the grocery store. <laughs> I don't know if your grocery stores carry them, but that makes sense because a lot of people do have little kitchen gardens. So for $1.99 each little herb, I'm going to have um, parsley, cilantro, basil, and these are newer, fresher plants because my basil and a lot of my annual herbs in the garden are done kind of you know they've flowered they aren't i can't do much with them at this point but i'm going to see how this works and see if i can have an herb garden all winter long for cooking and that'll be really exciting okay let's move then from propagating to garden plan ideas um share screen pick that Play, play. So there are so many different ways. I just showed you, I'm going to have a little container herb garden like some of these in the picture. And isn't this fun just to see how different people have potted their herbs and how beautiful they look and the variety of ways. I mean, you could just have one pot and keep it in your window if you don't have a lot of space for it. Or you can use a bigger pot, one bigger pot, and put a bunch of herbs together. And they'll they'll grow fine probably. Those roots kind of intertwine and they'll they'll make their way in the world. Um, I'll talk a bit, I guess I haven't talked yet about um, what you can do to fertilize them in there in a smaller space like that. I'll I'll give you some hints about that in a moment. Here's tin can garden. So I would suggest you use tin cans that had food in them so they're more food safe. But Here's, I love the Irish oatmeal can there, which is a nice bigger size can that will give more room for the roots. But you could, and these creative 
ladies and gentlemen who made these little gardens have decorated their cans and made them lovely. You could paint them, you could not paint them. Maybe you have a really cute label on a tin can and you want to make it into a garden. Here's a wheel gardens. Um, I thought these were really pretty in our area. And I know South Africa had pioneer prairies, wagons and all like we had here in in North America in the past, but a lot of those old wagon wheels are still around. We have uh, on our farm when we bought our little farm, there were some just people left here on the farm. But what a cute idea to have that if you had one, lay it down and plant your herbs in the different sections. Um, and or you can see the one on the upper right in my screen is somebody has built a little spoky wheel with bricks or stones or paving stones or the one on the bottom has wood. So the, the sky's the limit as far as what kind of garden or how large or small. Here's ladder gardens. The one in the middle, the lady had an old ladder and she put this as a design in her book. It was really a fun book called It's About Time and spelled like the herb time. But she just laid a ladder down on the ground and used that like as her little raised bed planter and put herbs in each different section so that kept them separated from one another. But other people have hung pots on a little ladder or can't really see that one, but you get the idea. Oh yeah, that's a wooden ladder, that blue one, a wooden ladder, an old ladder that maybe isn't useful as a ladder anymore. But when you have your gardener's eyes, you see that as, ooh, I can put plants on that and they will be spaced out and you know it'll look beautiful. How about a barrel garden? You can just get a wooden barrel somewhere or I think the one on the left is a, a larger clay pot and you just bunch all your herbs together in one barrel and that keeps it up away from things like rabbits or dogs or predators or whatever and you have your own little kitchen garden maybe on your porch or in your windowsill or wherever you're going to put your barrel. Then here's window boxes. Like I said, any shape, any size. You can do an indoor window box. You can do an outdoor window box. You can do one outdoors that you bring indoors in the winter. You know, you just whatever receptacle that you have, you can put your herbs in. Make sure it has good drainage and that it has a sunny location and the herbs will be happy. Here's little raised beds that you know, an orderly person maybe, or somebody who wants to separate them out, or maybe they've planted some herbs that might be invasive, they've made more division for their herbs. And you know, that one up in the upper left is I think just four by four. So you don't have to have a huge area. You don't have to even put them in the ground. There's so many choices and options when it comes to herbs. This is a kind I just saw recently that I thought was kind of fun that you could use bricks or stone to make a spiral garden. So again, it's using a small space, but getting a lot of plants in one area. I wanna try this next year. I was going to this year, but I didn't get around to it because we happen to have a whole bunch of old bricks on our property that were a part of an old building that was being knocked down. And I went and harvested them and brought them to my farm knowing someday I'm gonna find a use for them. And then of course, the, what I see as your best option in some ways, as far as care and all, is just to stick your herbs in the ground because that way they get the beautiful benefits of all the bacteria and the worms and the things that are in the soil that God has created rather than trying to have to kind of make your own um, soil for those plants. But even in the ground, a lot of times you might need to amend the soil a little bit. Let's see. Um, I don't know what, let me see what my next one is. Oh yeah, okay. Here's some themed garden ideas. I thought these were fun. You, when you're picking what herbs you wanna plant, maybe you have specifics that are your favorite or maybe you cook spaghetti every night or maybe you have a love for lemon flavor. And so you can pick herbs that would be what you would use most often for cooking. Um, and just because it says pizza garden, Leona, you mentioned that you would like for stews and all, those same herbs would be great for stews and really add a lot of flavor to like a meat potato stew kind of dish or whatever. The second one are French herbs. You know, maybe you're, you love Julia Child and you like to cook French cooking or curry, you could use curry herbs or maybe you really like hot spicy food. So you wanna plant some hot peppers. Um, and then I love the idea of a lemon garden. I've never thought of that until I was putting this together. I was like, oh, 
a lemon herb little garden would really be fun because I happen to love that lemon flavor. So there's some ideas. I'm sure you can come up with some of your own. Okay, let's go back out because I failed to mention a couple of things about amending your soil. Again, how do I do this, Ray? Escape. And then stop share. It's like three to get out and two to get back in. Okay, um, amending the soil. So I highly recommend you don't use commercial fertilizers. That's just, I've always tried to make our farm an organic place because we raised our children here and for my own health and for whatever, even though we live in a territory where it's mega farming and they spray the fields for corn and soybeans and I hate it. I call them yucky blucky sprayer trucks when they come to do that. Now the airplanes fly over and spray, I hate it. It's just not good for human health. And so um, I have a couple of recommendations for you to use some organic fertilizer if you feel you need to for your plants. You can stay here, I'll just bring it to it. Um, my current favorite, 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 well, I think I had a picture of them too. I'll show you in a minute, but my current favorite is um, worm castings. So what this is, is just worm poop. And I know it sounds weird, but it's sterilized worm poop. I see those faces on some of you there. <laughs> no faces like that allowed. Um, they have discovered that this is like one of the best things in the world. Amazing, isn't it? That it's something that God has created, not man, out of chemicals. It's because the worms digest the bacteria and things in the soil and poop it back out and you know like um, manure is a really good fertilizer as well but worm castings are really good because they don't burn the plant they don't have too much say nitrogen that's going to harm the plant they are slow release believe me when you buy a bag of worm casting it's not like you're touching poop it's kind of like compost they've composted it and there's no bad bacteria or anything in it it's just all good and it's safe like i love to throw it out knowing that it's you know what would naturally be in the soil i'm just adding a little extra so worm castings are really good so is compost um which is compost if you can maybe you have a compost pile we could talk about that another time but in your yard where you compost your waste your vegetable waste and things like that that you aren't eating but they still can decompose into really good nutrients for your soil so compost is the other um very highly recommended amendment that you can add to the soil to make it healthy for your plants. Um, okay, so let's talk a minute about saving seeds. We've only got two or three more things to cover. So, do you have to stop at noon, or are we okay? Okay, okay. So. Um, when you want to save your seeds, and this is something, again, this year, because of the pandemic, there are good things about a pandemic. I've been home and in my garden a lot more than usual. I'm usually going off to Bible schools and things like that, which is a really important priority, but it's been kind of fun to try some things I hadn't had time for in the past. So seed collection is very simple. All you do is you let the plant that you've grown, like um, here's a mint plant in my, I've got it as a flower in my flower vase because it's they're very pretty when they flower, but it's a mint plant that is going to flower. And then I will let the flowers mature. So the flower goes away and it matures into seeds. And then you can collect the seeds from the plant. Now mint is so easy to grow. I wouldn't collect mint seeds, but I have collected dill seeds and cilantro seeds and some of the basil they're very simple to grow and then you don't have to buy a seed packet next year. And when you do harvest your seeds, then you want to let them, um, you wait until they're fully ripe. And then if you can pick from your best specimens, like we talked earlier about the rootings, cause you are just basically cloning that plant. So you want the healthiest plant. You don't want to pick 
seeds that are really tiny off a sickly little plant because then you might not have such a strong start next year for your seeds. So select the best plants and then the trick is just to let it dry completely. So let it sit out in the sun on a little screen or something or I just have some in a little bowl and let it dry completely so no mold is going to develop when you store it. If you're going to, you can do this for vegetables and things too. Like with tomatoes, you would pull the seeds out and rinse them and get all the tomato guts off of it and um, let it dry. And then you can plant those seeds next year. Um, but then you just stick those seeds in a paper envelope. Here's just a mailing envelope and I've got it full of dill seeds for next year. You label it and um, here's a little, here's some arugula, which is a kind of a salad green. Um, and then you can put it in some sort of a storage container. If you just have a jar with a lid, that would be fine. I happen to have um, a plastic container that are supposed to be for some other purpose, but I saw somebody recommend it and they are perfect for seed storage. And it, this actually has a little briefcase. So I've got all my seeds labeled of what kind they are, all the herb seeds in one little thing and they all slide down in and then I can stick it, you know, in the basement or probably it'll stay outside all year, even though it probably shouldn't. They're probably better if you bring them to a cool, dry place and not leave them where they're gonna freeze. Although you can refrigerate and freeze seeds too. So having said that, I'm not that worried about it because um, a lot of the seed storage kind of things where they're worried that some plants are gonna be gone for extinct on the planet, they keep them frozen and the plants are still viable. But if you save your own seeds, they are viable for a few years or more. And that's a good trick I didn't really realize either. I always used to every new year buy a new packet of seeds and that's not necessary. If you have last year's seeds and you didn't use them all, plant them again. They might not have as much germination, so plant a little more than you might have otherwise, but they will be viable for more than one year. And so you can be less dependent on somebody else and more dependent on growing your own. Okay, so winter care of herb plants. Let's talk about that a couple minutes. Um, some plants are really good to bring in, especially maybe ones you might use more for stews and things like rosemary, the one that we took a cutting from a minute ago. Um, it's nice. In fact, I've this year I planted it in a pot because I knew I would take it in in the winter. So sometimes if you know it's a plant that you want that will overwinter well. Rosemary will grow for years and years. In South Africa, I don't know, in your more um, warm place, it probably would be a perennial outside and you never have to take it in. But here I have to take it in and I don't always have success with transplanting and digging it back out of the garden and putting it in a pot. So this year I tried just putting it in a pot from the start and I'll take it in and I think it will probably have less um, trouble because I'm doing it that way. Um, so you can also, like I said, you can start seeds. I tried that this year for the first time and I thought that was cool. I didn't know kind of, you can start seeds in the fall for some plants and then you have a new plant that then you're gonna take in rather than trying to take in a plant that's gone through the whole season and might be a little weaker. Um, so like we talked earlier, you just put them in your pots give them enough room to grow. So I would probably put an herb in a bigger pot like this if I'm starting it for winter. So it has room for those roots and you're trying to give it its best start. And um, you can then have it in your windowsill for the winter in your kitchen or whatever. Um, also with established plants that are outside that are perennials, it's good to mulch them. So that just means put some grass clippings or straw or something over them once you're getting close to your time of frost because in our area at least it can get really cold and if the the soil the ground gets that cold it'll often kill even a perennial plant but if you mulch them it insulates them better and then they will pop back to life for you next spring if they're perennials. Um, you also, if you have perennials, can just divide them. So you can take, dig down into the roots. The plant, you know, maybe has a wide set of roots underneath it. And you can take this much of it, take a quarter of the roots, dig that down, divide it from the other, the mother plant. The mother plant can stay in the ground and you can mulch it. But the part you divide, put in a pot with soil and take it in. And you've just made yourself uh, another herb for overwintering. 
Um, same with these plants, like the ones in the spring you're transplanting and all, is leave it in the shade for about a week before you just dig it out of the ground, put it in a pot and take it inside. It might not survive that, but leave it in the ground or leave it in the shade so it can get used maybe to less light and just acclimate to not having the, its roots in the ground anymore and get into that new soil and whatnot and then take it in. It's that same, it's kind of the reverse of hardening off that we spoke about earlier. Then you can also take your cuttings, your root cuttings and start little plants that way in the, in the fall. Um, and once they're inside, you want to keep them, if you can, between 60 and 70 degrees during the day and 50 to 60 degrees at night. Um, and put, like my rosemary, I haven't done so well with it, but this year I saw a couple of tricks. One is to mist the leaves. I think I have a squirt bottle here somewhere. No, I had just a little regular old squirt bottle. I forgot to bring it out. Um, just mist the leaves with water and that helps the moisture because in the winter it's much more dry. And somebody said, which I thought was a cool idea, just put a big bowl of water near your plants and it'll just help more, you know, as it evaporates, it'll help a little more moisture be in the air and the plants can soak that up and be healthier. Um, okay, then, oh, I was going to talk about soil men's letter. I already did. Okay, let's talk a minute about pests. The only thing I suggest for pests, like I said, with herbs in my area, I don't have a lot of trouble with pests. But if I did, or if I do, I use a, just a soap in water, as simple as that. Um, and it's insecticidal in itself, just soap. So um, soap has fatty acids in it that will suffocate the exoskeleton of insects like aphids, and white flies and spider mites and earwigs and stuff like that, which is really fascinating, isn't it? So you don't have to go be dependent on always going and buying something at the store as an insecticide and you don't have to spray really bad stuff on the plants that you want to eat. You can use soap and this is a pure Castile, a liquid soap, pure Castile liquid soap, if you can find that in your area. And I'll give you the recipe, but you just put two teaspoons of this per quart of water and you can add like a teaspoon of vegetable oil if you want because that just helps the soap to stick because you have to spray it directly on the bugs. So if your plant has tons of aphids on it, you want this soap to spray to get on their bodies because that's what kills them. Um, so that's a really simple, easy pesticide. Um, the one uh, soil amendment that I didn't talk about before, I love the compost and the worm castings, but there's one more that's very good for your plants. And it's made out of, it's, you don't have to get this brand, but it's made out of fish and seaweed. So it's just a liquid organic fertilizer made out of fish and or seaweed. And you can put it in that spray bottle, the pump spray I showed you earlier, and spray it on the foliage if they, maybe once a month if you want to fertilize them and get them growing faster. You can, um, a lot of people use it in compost tea, it's called, where you just put some in water and water the roots with your fertilizer this way. You can do the worm castings that way too. Put it in water strain it out or just leave the worm castings in there and pour it in the roots of your plants and that will make them very happy. Um, Ray, you want to get my thing in the freezer? Okay, I've got a few more slides and then I think we've about covered it for today. I hope I haven't gone too long. This is just a picture to show you that's, I don't know if that is dill, but it looks very much like it's dill. And that's what it looks like when it's ready to harvest. So I just, I harvested my dill. I took a piece of paper out there and shook those little seeds into a piece of paper and just slid them into, well, I let them dry. Although when I picked mine, they were super dry already because it was, they had been in the sun so long. So I just pretty much slid them into an envelope and put it on there. It's as simple as that to save your seeds. Um, here's the guy I just showed you this. That's how you might take a division of a plant. So you just take a shovel down there, dig it part of the plant off if it's a perennial that that will work for and throw it in a pot and you will be happy. Um, here's the insecticidal soap. This will be on the 
slides so you can look at it if you want that recipe it's very simple and even roses are medicinal and they're good for potpourris and things like that so roses are considered an herb as well there's a certain kind of rose the rambling rose that has um, rose hips that they make tea out of and very high in vitamin c okay here's our soil amendments i i want you to see that they're not only worms are not only good for birds and they're not only good for the soil they're also good for you to fertilize your plants and fish and the seaweed and then there's the compost pile if you have a small pile where you throw your kitchen waste and just throw some soil on top of it it will um, disintegrate into really good compost so make your world bloom and grow i really liked this picture because if you look to the left side of our the main garden there it's just a yard with brown dead grass and nothing happening and the guy in the middle or the lady i say maybe lady in the middle she's made her little space on this planet bloom and grow and she's reaping the benefit of it and there's flowers and food and herbs for her health and it's just great and then i love that the garden the backyard on the right side of the screen has a few plants there because i think the lady in the middle has shared some of her plants with the person that lives next door with her neighbor and so they're starting to see that there is really a lot of benefit into um, growing things for our health and for our food so i wanted to end by celebrating and i last time i oops last time i had um this recipe or this picture of these popsicles that you could do them with lemon balm but i had never tried it myself so i had to make some lemon balm popsicles mine aren't as purple as theirs i don't know quite why but i'm sure they're going to taste good i haven't tried them yet but i wanted to share them with you if you were here i would have given you one but you'll have to have a plantastic day without me very nice I love, yeah, lemon and lavender are lovely together. <laughs>